Hello, everybody. So this is uh, part of our dynamic thinking webinar series. Um, and this webinar is going to cover leveraging the three plus two automatic toolpath. Uh, this is a new toolpath for MasterCam 2021. Uh, we are going to focus it on, you know, leveraging that toolpath itself. But as some background, I am going to cover, you know, some other three plus two uh, machining principles, uh, milling principles as we walk through. And we're going to talk a lot about OptiRough as well. So when we talk about three plus two programming, um, we really want to understand um, what's involved there. And, and it's, you know, coming from different planes to machine apart. When we're talking about three plus two, we're on a five axis machine um, and we're accessing different planes around the part. Uh, at any given time, three of those axes are locked, um, or you only have three. You're, at any given time, five axes are locked when you're machining, um, but you've only got three axis motion in that plane. And then two of the axes are free to rotate to a different plane and start machining again. So I just want to quickly look at what's involved in programming a part like this. Um, so this is the arrow stand part, one of our MasterCam signature part series. And I want to talk about, you know, typically how I program a part. You know, if I'm if I'm doing a part like this in a five axis machine and I'm roughing it, I'm doing that with the OptiRough toolpath with a three plus two um, method. And what am I talking about with that? Well, it's typically coming right from the top with an OptiRough toolpath. You know, something like this, machining down the part, right? And then I'd create a stock model of the material of what's left, right? So now I can see what material there is, right? And now I'm hooking a secondary Opti Rest or an Opti Rough with Rest Machining turned on operation to come from a different plane, seeing that stock model. So in the in that opti rough operation, I'm looking at that stock model that I created afterwards and creating a new machine model. And that continues around the whole part, right? So for on a, tip, on a, on a typical part, I'm doing five-sided machining, the top and the four side planes, you know, with different parts, sometimes different planes make sense. I may be doing 10 planes around the part. I, I may only be doing three. I may only be doing two to get to the whole part. I might just come from the top or from the front and the back and I can access the whole part. Just depends on part nature, right? But what you'll notice is to machine this part from five planes, as I typically would, I've actually got, I've got a stock model, an initial stock model where my stock set up for my stock. And then I've got five dynamic opti rough rest operations, right? And then I've also got, one, two, three, four, five stock models that show that that stock as we progress through the part. And I like to color code my stock models so that I understand, you know, what operation did did what to a part, right? And in the end, I'm left with a stock model that looks something like this and is ready for secondary machining operations. You know, a pocketing operation to clean out a little pocket, do some drilling, uh, finishing passes, all that. You know, that's where I that's where I'd end up. Uh, so, so the goal of three plus two roughing is to get to something like what you see here, right? That's the end goal. Um, so what I want to talk about now is possibly, I, I don't want to call them issues and I don't want to call them concerns, but, but things that you have to be aware of uh, with the OptiRough toolpath when you're doing three plus two programming. Right, and for that, I'm gonna transition back to my slide here. And one of the biggest things is whether you're copying these tool paths down one after the other and, and changing settings or whatever, you're going to need to make adjustments for each tool path and each plane that that tool path sits on. It's just, it's, it's just the nature of programming with OptiRough. It has very specific linking planes. I mean, after all, it is a three axis tool path. Um, it's a three axis toolpath that you're applying to different planes around a part, right? So it needs specific parameters to, to do each one of those planes. Um, some of those concerns are clearance values. 
you know, if I have my offset as I do in this part, let's see, let me turn on the, the gnomon here, right? My offset is up here coming from the top. Well, a clearance value of zero or 10 millimeters works for this top plane. But if I come over to the front and start machining on the front plane, if I use a clearance value of zero, that's going to cause a gouge, right? Because that's actually in the middle of the part. So that would need a value out here, something like 100 millimeters, right, for a clearance value. So that's a, that's a tweak that I've got to make. And that's the type of thing I'm talking about with, with OptiRough. That's the kind of things that you've got to address, right? Things like uh, your min and max values for your steep shallow settings in OptiRough, right? Each plane is going to require different settings um, as you move through processing that part. Um, you've got to make sure that those stock models are hooked up correctly. Like I showed you in that where we did an, an OptiRest stock model, an OptiRest stock model. I've got to make sure that all those are correct. I've got to make sure that each operation is referencing the correct stock model. Otherwise, I'll be left cutting air or running into material I didn't know was that the toolpath didn't know was there. Right. So so that's you know, that takes some intelligence and some some work. I got a question here that says, how do you color code your different stock models and end up with a multicolored stock model after rough? So that's a great question. Uh, I think we can jump right into that real quick before we move on. And the way I do that is it's very simple. Uh, just giving each stock model a unique color, right? By giving each stock model a unique color, that's gonna show the old stock model and then what's changed. And that's how that would work. And I find that very, very useful because at the end, when I'm left with that multicolored stock model, I can now see what operation is responsible for what. So if I have a gouge, I can direct myself directly to which operation caused that gouge. Because if it's a purple gouge, well, it's the operation that happened on the back plane. I know that right off the bat with that color coding. So great question. Thank you. Um, moving back over. Things like containments, those are also going to be need to they, those are also going to need to be adjusted per toolpath per plane. Um, some other concerns, right? Uh, you're maintaining a lot of stock models, so we kind of talked about how you've got to hook those up. Uh, you've got to be cognizant of what those stock models are looking at, what they're looking for, and how it all works together, right? So that's that's very important, and it's like I said, it's it's just the nature of having that much control with those tool paths. And then simply size, right? That you're talking about five different operations with five different stock models. If you make a mistake in tolerancing something like a stock model, it's going to bite you all the way down through this program, right? So you've gotta be very cognizant of what your tolerances is or that Mastercam file size is just gonna grow um, unnecessarily. So really what we're talking about here, um, what a lot of this page is saying is that you as the programmer using OptiRough to three plus two machine need skill, right? You need to know how to run Mastercam. You need to know how to use OptiRough. It's, it's a pretty simplistic process uh, and, and very trainable, you, can, you know, to understand how to do this, but you do need to know how to do it. You do need to know how to control it to get good results. All right, so let's let's move on here. Oh, and lastly, you know, it's a plane intensive process. So you've also got to be able to understand how the plane manager work works, how it interacts with tool paths, how tool planes work, uh, WCS, all that needs to be understood uh, to get good results out of an Opti tool path. So I said we were going to talk about three plus two automatic in this webinar. Um, I think the first question we ask is, well, what is it? Um, and it's a toolpath that's new for Mastercam 2021. It does require a multi-axis license. Um, so you do have to have Mastercam multi-axis to be able to run 3 plus 2 automatic, unlike, Ropti, unlike OptiRough, which only requires a mil 3D uh, license. And that's actually changing in future releases as well, um, for the better. And um, what it does is it creates multi-plane three-axis toolpaths for roughing. So it's creating, you know, different toolpaths along different planes all combined into one toolpath. It analyzes, the way that it does that is it analyzes the model 
in the stock that you've specified, stock is very important with this toolpath, to optimize the roughing toolpaths. Okay, it calculates remaining stock after each plane and then computes the new toolpath at that next plane and tries to optimize it as best it can. Remember, this isn't a human brain making these decisions. This is all a, a algorithm doing this. Uh, it's an algorithm optimization. So it may not always make the most sense to you. Uh, it's doing it through volumetric calculations, right? So that's something to be aware of. And we're gonna talk about how we can really tailor this thing to give us results that we're actually looking for. Uh, and then this will continue, this process continues until only a defined amount of stock remains, you know, what your stock to leave values that you specified on the model geometry page are. And the, the real thing about this is all contained in one toolpath. You're not making five different stock models, five different operations. It's all done in one. Okay. So let's go through and quickly program a three plus two automatic toolpath on this part. So I'm going to jump back into Mastercam here, and I'm going to shut off all the OptiRough. And you'll see that we have, like I talked about, this existing uh, stock, right? And I have that defined as my first operation as a stock model. So I'm going to go in and create a 3 plus 2 automatic toolpath on this part, all right? So that's just going to be in the multi-axis gallery down underneath application, three plus two automatic roughing. I'll launch that. Takes a couple seconds here to launch. Okay, so I already have a bull nose end mill defined here with a relieve shank. Uh, the cutting length is 18 millimeters, but it's relieved, let's see, up to 30, up to 30 millimeters. Okay, and I've got a pretty standard ER32 uh, holder here. So the first thing I want to do is go in and define my uh, model geometry. All right, this is this page is not going to look any different to you than if you're used to something like an OptiRough, right? This is very standard across Mastercam at this point. So for machining geometry, I'm going to pick the part through a triple click. I can grab the whole part model, right? And I want to leave one mil on there on the floors and walls. Okay, and then I'm gonna create an avoidance group. And you can always double click this, say vice. Uh, I can change the color of that avoidance group in case I wanna see the, see the differences of what I'm looking at um, once I go back out to the, the graphic screen. And I'm gonna leave four on the vice and vice jaws just because I don't, I mean, I wanna make sure I stay away from, from the work holding. I'm gonna select some entities. I'll go into the, let's go into the front plane here. I'll do a window select. I don't wanna grab any faces on that standoff. So I'll just do a triple click on the two jaws. There we go. So we've got those components and you can see, you know, the model's color coded. I still haven't picked the standoff and you could do it as machining geometry, but I don't specifically need to machine that. That's just an artifact of trying to machine this in the vise. Uh, it's extra material on a secondary operation that's probably going to all be cut off. So I'm not too concerned about it. So I'm going to put it in avoidance geometry. So I'm not specifically cutting uh, that feature. I'm going to create another avoidance geometry. And let's go out, query the model here. Again, a triple click. Okay, so now I have everything defined in the model, model geometry page. We've got our tool, we've got our holder. Stock is very important. I want to make sure that this toolpath knows exactly what stock I'm using. I could use user selected geometry and go out and pick a model off the part if I had modeled my stock. I did do that, but instead I built a stock model. I like using stock models because it allows me to visualize uh, the stock without going into levels manager. I can do it right from my toolpath manager. So I'll use that stock model stock. Um, Cut pattern, this is where you're going to specify uh, how you wanna cut this part. We do have, you know, you can pick an offset, a parallel, or a dynamic algorithm to, to rough with. Um, nine and a half times out of 10, I'm gonna pick dynamic here. And we had 18 millimeters of flute on that tool, 15 should be fine. Uh, this is just gonna be 
uh, aluminum, 6061 aluminum. So I know this ISCAR tool that I'm using here is more than capable of a 50 to 70% step over. Uh, so I'll spec, I'll spec six, six as the 50% step over, but with a desired step over of something like five millimeters. Okay. Um, the other unique thing that three plus two automatic has that um, op, something like OptiRough doesn't have is it has, um, you know how we have step ups with OptiRough? Well, we, we call those intermediate slices in this tool path. And they can be done after each step step or after last step step. Now, what that means is after each is going to do your step down, which we defined as 15 millimeters, then it's going to step up from there, right? If I do after last, that's going to do all the step downs and then step up from the whole bottom of the part up. Uh, at first, when I was evaluating this, I thought it was a little silly because all it's really doing is leaving stock on the part um, and creating collision scenarios with your holder against uncut stock where steps step ups would have got rid of that stock. However, if you think about it from a tool perspective, when you get into those step ups, you start in some cases, you can lighten up that chip load. Um, you could, you know, you're taking less of a cut against the tool. So you might be only using the bottom part of the tool. You could start prematurely wearing or notching the tool in different areas. So after last depth step is something that could be really good for, you know, materials that are not free machining, you know, very difficult to cut materials that might wear the tool. This way you're taking full cuts with that flute at the beginning, instead of coming back after notching the tool and then taking a full cut. So it can help with tool wear. Uh, it keeps that tool in optimal cutting condition for as long as possible. So that's, that's uh, an interesting feature of this tool path. Um, tool access control, this is where it gets you know, this is where it gets real interesting. This is how you're controlling the planes that the toolpath comes from. Now, I've done a bunch of testing on this and, and evaluation, and my biggest recommendation with this toolpath at this point is to use a manual plane definition. Um, it is possible to use automatic. Um, we have, you know, this was the first release of this toolpath. We have some reported stuff where, you know, automatic isn't behaving the way we should, and it is going to get better release by release. Um, but as of now in 2021, I would highly recommend, just based off of what I've done, to use the manual setup. And I have saved this off to my defaults. By default, this is gonna come in blank, but I've saved to my defaults a, um, a set of planes that are basically five-sided planes. These are vectors now. These aren't directly hooked into the plane manager, but it's 001, that's the top plane, 100 right, left, front, and back, okay? If I wanted to add another plane, I can easily come in here and say, select tool plane. All right, we wanna do from solid face. I wanna use this as my tool plane. Perfect, so it's added another vector in there. Now that is not associative to the plane manager. And it's not hooked to the plane manager in any way. It's just a vector relative to the WCS. Now that's that's actually a positive thing. And when we get into leveraging this tool path further, I'm gonna show you why that's positive, okay? And we've got a lot of questions popping up. I'm gonna try and keep to what I got and then we'll circle back to some of these questions that you guys are asking. I see they're, they're great questions, but I just, I don't want to get too derailed or I won't get through the subject I'm trying to trying to cover here today. So I, I am going to delete this one and just leave it at five sided machining. Now, for um, for time stake in this webinar, I am not going to do not going to generate this toolpath. I've got one pre generated and I will generate one later on. Um, but you can think about it in the way where we were showing OptiRough, right? We're generating five toolpaths five stock models, that's actually happening in the background, right? So I don't need you guys to sit around here and we can watch a multi-threading manager go through for five minutes. Um, trust me, it does, it does generate. And here is, you know, the result. Now, one thing I wanna talk about here is, this is kind of messy, right? This is kind of difficult to understand. What exactly am I looking at here? 
Okay, it's hard hard to say. Um, so with three plus, and why is that? Would be a better question. Well, let's show you what OptiRough looks like from five planes. You know, ignoring the stock models, it's the same mess, right? We're just used to seeing one toolpath at a time, one plane at a time. So that's where this becomes critical to really, you know, use your simulation tools, use uh, Verify, you know, Backplot and Machine Sim to really understand what's going to happen. I also, one thing that I really like to do is to create a stock model after that. Even if this is my final thing and I'm not going to use this for anything, creating a stock model is almost like instant verification, right? At least I get an idea of where there's stock and where there's not. Um, Let's look at a stock model, I mean, a machine simulation of what this three plus two toolpath is going to look like. And one thing I wanna point out is this part starts cutting at a strange 45 degree angle, right? So if this is something you can't deal with as a programmer, you know, you like to have things a certain way, Automatic three plus two is not going to be for you, right? This is this is an algorithm that's choosing planes for you, choosing toolpaths for you uh, in an automatic way. You have, you know, you're giving it a vector, but that's it. Then it's trying to optimize things, and how it chooses that is, you know, it's up to a computer. It's not up to a human being anymore. So, you know, that's that's something you got to be aware of. But in the end, you know, we're left with a roughed out component. Right, we get to a similar result as we would with that OptiRough toolpath. All right, so that's you know, and that was that's it's it is that easy when you're using manual to get to this type of result. Now let's say, oh man, but why did it leave material here? Maybe I can go in and start tweaking parameters to get that better. And 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 now you're now you're asking to go down a path of tweaking something automatic to be better than what it automatically gave you, right? And it's very difficult to, to come back out of that with a successful result. And that's what I've seen. So it's gonna be one of those things that what you get, what you see is, is sort of what you get. You know, there's, there's not a lot of adjustments that you can make to this to, to make it that much better. And, and obviously this is, a, this is a first release of this toolpath. Uh, we are, you know, looking at this stuff trying to get some of trying to get it to be better. I mean, it's it's better now than it was um, in beta and it will continue to get better release by release. But using the manual planes, uh, I do get a pretty, pretty decent result. I'm able to get a lot of material off really quickly. Okay. Um, okay, so this is, this is a question that fits in really well here. Um, Somebody's asking, is there any possibility to edit the sequence of the three, pat, three plus two tool paths? Um, and 100% there is. So if we go back into this tool path and we look at our tool axis control, I can reorient. That's, that's another advantage of using the manual planes is I can reorient and reorder these planes however I want, right? It will respect the order in this manual plane mode. So it's gonna do the top first, then it's gonna do the right, then it's gonna do the left. But if I wanted to do top, right, front, left, back, I would just reorder those planes. Okay, so that was a great question, thank you. Okay, um, so moving on, let me jump back into my PowerPoint here. And I do have uh, a video of this actually machining. And I don't wanna, you know, have you guys sit here and watch a video the whole time, but you know, it did work. It's it's a it's a functional toolpath, cuts very similarly to the to an OptiRough, albeit uh, not quite as efficient. We'll touch on that a little further into this presentation. Zoom ahead a little bit here. I want to get to a point. Yeah, let's see what that looks like. I want to show you the index moves because that's something I really want to highlight here. So just give it a second to calculate. It's a little slower on the meeting.
So what I'm talking about here is on the index moves from one side of the part to the other, we're no longer with this toolpath, we're no longer relying on post-processor logic. Uh, those, as you can see here, that index is occurring inside the toolpath. Okay, so there's no, you know, you're not transitioning from one toolpath to the other and then relying on the post-processor to make a decision about how to do that transition. It's all defined motion inside the toolpath and those transitions tend to work really well um, in this in this environment. So we'll see if we get, yeah, there's the transition right there. So you get a really nice smooth transition that is completely stock aware and all contained inside that toolpath, which is pretty neat. Okay, moving on. So is, Yeah, so we've got another quick question I'll jump into here. This one's good. Can you control manual tool axis control with the created planes on weird angles? And absolutely you can. Um, just as I was showing here, if I wanted to do a different plane here, I can just as easily say, well, I don't want to do this. What is this? This is the minus Y. That's the back plane. So I don't want to use the back plane. So I'm going to remove that and I'm going to do select tool plane. I'll do a dynamic. I'll place it on this corner. Oh, oh, that's not oh yeah, that so the view that actually comes from the G view. I actually want to do a solid face and say we want to pick this weird angle. We want to come in from here, right? Perfect. That's going to throw that right in there. So I can do any angle I want. Um, based off of, you can select a tool plane, so you could create a plane outside of this toolpath altogether and select it. Um, but yeah, you can do any plane you want using manual. Okay, so back in here. So three plus two automatic, is it better than OptiRough? You know, that's that's a big statement, right? OptiRough is awesome. So is it better than OptiRough? Um, and I'm going to break that into a couple different questions here. So is it faster to program? To me, typically, yes. Typically, it is going to be faster to program a roughed out toolpath, but it depends. And it depends on what kind of precision you're looking for out of your roughing algorithm. Are you just wanting to get material off of there in as little programming effort as possible? Well, then, yeah, 3 plus 2 automatic is going to be faster. But if you're looking to get material off of your part in a specific way, you'll probably burn time trying to get 3 plus 2 to perform in the way you want. Um, so, you know, that like with anything, yeah, but sometimes no, <laughs> right? And then is it faster in cycle time at the machine? Is it more efficient than OptiRough? And in my testing at the machine, it is typically not. Um, in almost every case I ran, if I manually programmed with OptiRough, uh, three plus two automatic is going to be slower, but, but let's in cycle time, but let's, let's address that for a second, right? So here I'm going to back up what that claim that I just made, right? This was on that part that we just cut, we just programmed, uh, the total machining time in that video that you watched was 25 minutes and 37 seconds. So 25 and a half minutes, okay? By manually going through and programming that with OptiRough, using the same five planes, the same feeds and speeds with similar cut parameters, just, you know, you're running it through OptiRough instead of three plus two automatic, I'm getting a total machining time of just over 18 minutes, right? So you're leaving seven minutes on the table in machine time. Um, so this is, this is a great question. I just got sometimes dynamic toolpaths can cut a lot of air. Can that be adjusted on this toolpath? Um, honestly, you're going to have less control over air cuts in three plus two automatic than you will in Opti. Um, Opti tends to be a more efficient path from a machining, from a machine efficiency standpoint. And that's what, that's one thing I want to get across here. So, but. Although you see three plus two automatic taking longer at the machine, 
to program with five planes in OptiRough, it took me 22 minutes to do that. And that was me using very efficient methods, you know, dragging and dropping tool paths, dragging and dropping stock models, associating things as quick as I could. I was actually well practiced uh, at the point that when I did that in 22 minutes, right? If I was, and I was able to program that three plus two, you guys watched me do that. Other than generation time, the actual programming is very quick, okay? So you can start to see, well, you know, 22 minutes added on top of that 18 minutes, we're at 30, we're at 30 something minutes, right? Um, so I'm, I'm, the, the playing field is getting a little more equal there. Uh, what if I wasn't an experienced programmer? What if I didn't really know how to use OptiRough and didn't really know how to use the plane manager and planes and all that? You could spend days to get a less efficient result than that three plus two automatic result. Okay, so um, that's that's important to understand. Uh, another question I just got was, how reliable is the post-processing? Did you have to use the miscellaneous options at all? And what I will say is the post-processing for this in the first tests I ran back before MasterCam 2021 was in beta, I was scared to death of that, that, that the post would not be able to handle this, especially with those linking moves and things like that. And the truth of the matter is three plus two automatic is really, it's a straight five axis um, tool path. And all that motion is controlled inside that tool path. I did not have a single issue on the post-processing side. So uh, that, that, that came as a surprise to me. It's just in the nature of how we run, uh, run those tool, how we output the three plus two automatic tool path. The other thing I want to touch on is from an efficiency side is three plus two automatic roughing that part from five sides. I was left with a resultant stock volume of 100, almost 133 uh, cubic millimeters, right? If I did that same thing with OptiRough, those same five planes, I'm left with 131,000 cubic millimeters, right? So this is, again, using those same parameters. And I'd also like you to look at the two models there, what was left. And you'll see that the OptiRough was just a more visually pleasing result, right? It's just, you know, you're, you're, leaving, you're leaving less to chance with OptiRough. You're, you're going to get a cleaner result from that method. Uh, and again, not that anything is really wrong with that first result with three plus two automatic. It might not look as pretty, but in the end, it's going to accomplish the same goals. Maybe not if you're in, you know, tough to machine materials where it's, you've got to be very specific about where you leave material and where you take it off. Uh, but with, you know, in something like aluminum where I'm cutting there, who cares if there's, you know, an extra three millimeter here, two millimeter there, it's, it's not going to affect my machining time post this roughing. Right. Uh, with, re with regard to that, where we talked about the post-processing, there's another question here. If the sequence of planes are moved incorrectly, will a crashing situation be detected? And y yeah, it's going to be detected and never happen. Uh, all those moves, like I said, are contained inside that tool path, that singular tool path, and the crashing will be completely avoided. Uh, it's, it's all collision checked against the stock, against the in-process stock between planes. All that is going to be gouge check, so that is a big advantage. All right, so talking about this, you know, we said, oh, okay, the resultant stock volume's worse. You know, it's less efficient on the machine. Yeah, it's faster the program, but so when does three plus two auto make sense, right? When when would that make sense to use that toolpath? Um, and I just want to I want to answer that by asking a few questions, right? Is this, is this program that you're doing going to only be roughing one part, right? That's, that's now making it, uh, okay, well, three plus two auto might be good. You know, I'm just making this one part. I just got to get some material off here and I got to go work on something else while that's happening. Let me just run this on there. Okay, great. You start taking that conversation to, how about a thousand parts? In a thousand parts, you're adding seven minutes of machining time to that part. That's 
7,000 minutes you added to that part. You could spend hours and hours refining a OptiRough to really dial it in and still come out ahead of the game if you were making a thousand of these, right? So that's where it starts to say, well, do I really want to use three plus two automatic for this? Do I want to let a computer program my part or do I want to program it and have it do what I want it to do, right? And then is it an exotic material or a special, you know, a special aerospace process or something where it's it's got to be done a certain way? Well, you don't want to leave that. If it's got to be done a certain way or things have to be uh, specifically controlled, that, that machining environment has to be specifically controlled. You don't want to leave this up to chance with a computer algorithm, right? You want to make sure that it's dialed in and that's where OptiRough will, will really help you. And even, you know, you can get down to running contours in various areas to get rid of the, so you really want to intimately get into your machining process. You're probably not going to, three plus two automatic is probably going to be a substandard result to do what you're looking for in that case. And then the last question is, what is your level of programming skill? If you don't know how to use OptiRough, you're, you could still end up with a far worse result than Auto 3 Plus 2 will give you in a few minutes, even if you spend days programming, right? So that's, that's something to consider as well. So the last thing we, I wanted to touch on here is, you know, using 3 Plus 2 in a more effective way, right? We just showed how quickly, how quick it can be to, pro, uh, to, to set up. Um, but there is some, you know, there is some tuning you can do. And once you really get it the way you want it, if you've got a good tool path, well, now you got to do that every time with every part. And what I want to show you is how effective it can be using import export to take a proven good tool path and apply it to a totally different part. Right. And, and, and look at that process. So to do that, let's jump uh, back into Mastercam here. I'm going to go back to this this part we were looking at before. And we have this 3 plus 2 automatic toolpath. We ran on the machine. We know it's good. Um, now the boss comes by and says, okay, I want you to machine this other part. It's a different size stock. Uh, it does fit in the same vise, but, you know, it's, it's a totally different part. Totally, totally different, right? So what I can do is I can come in here and say, all right, well, let's – Let's export this 3 plus 2 automatic toolpath. I'll just, for the sake of this discussion here, I'll throw it on my desktop and I'll call this 3 plus 2. Okay. And I want to save this second operation. Hit apply. That'll dump this out onto my desktop as an operations file. Okay, so now I open my new part, right? I set up my stock. I set up a little standoff to get it, you know, up so I can five-sided machine it, right? And now I'll come in here and say, all right, I want to import an operation. And I'll navigate out to that 3 plus 2 that we just saved. Okay, I'll hit apply. It imported it, great. All right, so now we have a full five-plane, five-sided machining operation in our part. We basically have that OptiRough stock model, OptiRough stock model, OptiRough stock model contained in this one operation, right? And the beauty of it being like this is now I just have to set up my model geometry and my stock. Everything else is, is going to work. Right, because that linking is all automatic. It's all stock aware. Everything is going to be uh, uh, going to adjust to to the parameters of this file, to the the constraints of this this part. Right. So I'll go into my parameters and it takes a second to launch here. So the model geometry page. I am going to have to set that up. Okay, I want to leave one mil on each the wall and the floor here. And then for the vice, again, I don't want to select that standoff, so I'm just going to grab these vice jaws separately. All right, and then I'll add another group 
and then this one can be that standoff. Remember, we left four on the walls and the floor of the vise, and we left one on the standoff. So it's a similar part, right? But completely different stock size, completely different part in every way, right? Um, and then the last thing, I've got to make sure I hook up the stock to that part. Okay, everything else I'm just going to leave alone. No problem there. Okay, the, the real power here is in that linking. I have an automatic setting here that's going to make sure that that linking succeeds uh, on that part and is gouge free. So I am going to calculate this toolpath. It is going to take, you know, four or five minutes here. But while that's calculating, I'm going to show you a um the resultant of doing this so let's let that go once i can kick it out into the multi-threading manager i'll show you a video of that running all right so we've got that running that's generating the background keep an eye on that it's 11:46. we started it let's jump back in here all right so this is going to be uh this toolpath machining here And we'll just let this run until um, our toolpath gets calculated inside of MasterCam. So while this is going, I'm going to look at some of these questions here. You guys have been sending a lot in here, and I appreciate that. So there's a question. Hey, Jesse, what should the stock tolerance uh, be? Is Should it be the same as the toolpath or the cutting tolerance or smaller or larger? And... I think the same principle applies here that applies to to a stock model, right? You can get that. You can go as large as you know you can. Typically, for me, um, on a stock model, it depends on how much stock I'm leaving on the part and and the material type, right? If it's just aluminum on my next operations, I don't really care if there's a little extra stock here and there. So I can open that up. You know, if I've got a if I'm leaving one mil on the on the uh, part, I could open that up to half a millimeter for tolerance, right? Uh, so it, it it really depends on on your process, but it, it should always be as loose as can be effectively used for your process. So that was a great question. Uh, another question. Is there any possible way to know how much material has been taken off since three plus two knows the stock and part volume? Yeah, I mean, you'd have to do that manually. Uh, you can do that through an analysis with the stock model uh, and meshes, but there's no way inside the tool path to be able to see that, no. Can you add a three plus two automatic path after an existing opti rough? Yes. Absolutely. You make a stock model after an opti rough and then do a three plus two auto. Uh, it will respect that stock model just as we're doing it as an initial operation. You could completely use it as a rest roughing. Uh, you could also do it with different tools. So you could rough like we are here with a 12 millimeter bull. And then I could come in with a uh, six millimeter bull after and use that resultant stock model as uh, the stock for that next three plus two automatic. So that was a great question. Uh, so I think that about covers the questions here. Just reading through the questions. Yeah, I think we got it. Okay. Well, our toolpath ended up finishing generating here. So we'll jump back into MasterCam. And, you know, you see we've got the result. Now, some of the motion you may see, you know, you see some undesirable motion down here, right, down along the part. And this is, this is really something I want to highlight. This toolpath is automatic, okay? So if stuff like this is going to bother you, that's, that is going to be a problem because you gave it stock. You know, that was that big hunk of stock, and you told it to get rid of as much as you could, right? This is what our stock looked like. 
So that toolpath down there is down trying to get these lower corners of the stock uh, while it can without getting within four millimeters of this jaw. So it's doing what you asked, but if you say, well, I don't like these, these pieces of tool motion and that, that bothers me, well, you're really saying to me is, I prefer OptiRough because I can control that, right? So you, you, need, to, you need to understand that, right? Um, there is ways to get around that. I could draw a big block of material down here and use it as a check surface to drive that up. But what I'm trying to highlight is you're starting to try and tweak something to get results out of something, get results out of it that, you know, it's it's just not going to hand you. And now you're you're doing enough work where I start to question whether it's advantageous to use this three plus two automatic, right? Okay, so moving on, uh, let's talk about, so we just programmed this new part with 3 plus 2 automatic using import export or export import, right? How long would it take you to program that part from scratch with Opti and stock models? So I tried that, I did it like three times, different ways, just messing around with it. And it was taking me 20 to 30 minutes, no matter what I did to get good OptiRough toolpath, right? Well, that's significantly larger than what it just took to get the way we're doing it with import export. So why not use, well, that's not fair, right? Why not use export and import on OptiRough, right? Wouldn't that make it just as fast if I had five stock models and five OptiRough tool paths, why can't I just import those and use those? Um, and like other tricks are, you know, creating a template file and then dragging your geometry in and rehooking it up, right? You can, doing this, you can get close really quick, right? You get the structure of your toolpath, you get toolpath on the part, you can get close really quick, right? But to get that level of refinement that you're looking out of OptiRough, where it's actually doing what you want it to and not gouging and, you know, your linking parameters set up correctly, that takes almost as long as doing it just from scratch, you know, depending on the complexity of the part. So you got to worry about this. This came from that earlier slide we were looking at, but you've got to worry about things like clearance values, your min max for steep shallow, setting up your stock models appropriately, make sure they're referencing the right thing. You got to make sure your containments are right. All your model geometry has to be reassociated for each toolpath. Think about that now. That was five toolpaths. We got to go in and set up that model geometry correctly five times, right? How many times do you have to do it with Auto 3 plus 2? Once. It's one tool path. So, you know, there, there is there is advantages there. And and then what happens if you want to adjust feeds and speeds of those tool paths, right? Well, some of it can be controlled using like, um, here, we'll jump in here. I'll show you that real quick. You can use uh, edit common parameters. So you could jump in here and say, all right, I want to grab all the opti roughs and then let's edit common parameters. You know, I can go in and change things like spindle speed and feed rates. And there's some stuff I can change there, but I can't change step over on all of those at the same time, right? Uh, I can't change my step up value all at the same time. I got to go in and change those, right? Um, whereas with, um, with automatic three plus two, it's one one change. I go into that toolpath, one change. Again, the problem's going to be there. It's going to be a long regen time. But it would be if you went in and adjusted five toolpaths at the same time and then regen them all, right? So really understanding the advantages and the disadvantages. And, and I think the biggest point here is those six bullet points are the reason that Opti is so powerful and is so precise and you have so much control over the result, right? So the same, the same negative bullet points can be used in a positive light, and they are. They are a positive part of what OptiRough is. So I, I, I'm trying to, to give you a truthful overview of what these toolpaths are without saying, you know, you should be using this or this is the greatest thing ever. Neither one it is the answer to everything. What I, what I really want to get across to you is that 3 plus 2 automatic is another tool. And where it makes sense, it can really make sense. 
and where it where it flounders, it can be completely pointless, right? So the important part of this is it's is knowing when and where to use that, right? So I think in conclusion here, you've got to ask yourself. I, I, I'm pretty sure I covered this, but I I, I want to kind of bring it all back together here. You've got to ask yourself what is important to you as the programmer or as the guy running the machine or as the guy in charge of production or as the shop manager or as the owner of the company, you know, what is important to you? Is it for this project, is it maximum machining efficiency and control? Is that the most important thing? Well, then typical three plus two roughing that you've been doing for 10 years, you know, using OptiRough, using those other tool paths to get in there and rough out material exactly how you want it roughed out is going to be the best right? But do you need to get this on the shop floor as quickly and as easily as you can with a similar result to above? Um, maybe not quite as good, but in the end, is it going to matter? And if that's the answer, you, you want to get this out and running and cutting and you got to move on to something else while that's cutting, well, this might be, this might be the answer. If you've got a, uh, you know, a green programmer who really can't, I mean, this is a way that you can have somebody making three plus two roughing operations. You know, if you give them a seed file that has it set up, they can drop that in and cut really, really quickly, right? So there is there is some advantage there. With that, um, I, I hope you guys found this informative.